could you guys tell me a little bit more about the highway being built here? Because that that must have really changed up a lot. Yes. Oh yeah, because there was so homes. Good, that's Breathwood. They tore our homes all along that stretch on Wigan where seventy four is running now. I know that the good twenty five homes they took down, just they tore down. Yeah. To make the interstate from access from 74 to come through the neighborhood, we have just a third a third way. That's what they did. They just, they that did is Annie it. Williams and her sister Alberta Wharton, longtime residents of Cincinnati's South Cumminsville neighborhood. I-74 came into their neighborhoods when they were young women, and it changed everything. Houses were torn down, streets they knew and played on, like Draymond Avenue, became dead ends. And then they dead in Draymond down, so they just locked us in, basically. They locked us in. Picture this. You're going to Mr. Jean's Hot Dogs at the corner of Draymond and Beekman, but instead of crossing the street like before, you have to climb a pedestrian bridge over the heavy local traffic caused by I-74. Aside from dividing up the streets and, and tearing down the homes, they split They're up the, the neighborhood. The That's board. exactly what they did. In Cincinnati, we have five large highways, Interstate 71, 74, and 75, which crisscrossed through Cincinnati's metropolis, 471, which takes you from downtown through Kentucky, to our last highway, 275, which loops around the greater Cincinnati region. They're so integral to our urban landscape, it's hard to imagine that they weren't always here. But of course, once upon a time, there weren't any highways in Cincinnati or anywhere in the U.S. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1944 allocated funding for America's first interregional network of highways, meant to bypass densely populated urban centers and get people around the country quickly. The federal government would pitch in 50% of these funds, and the states were expected to match the rest. But in the 1950s, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Highway Act of 1956. Now, the federal government would cover 90% of the cost of highway construction. With the passage by Congress of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, the national system of interstate and defense highways got underway. Under this system, it is intended to build 41,000 miles of multiple lane controlled access highways in 15 years. Highways of the future, for they would be adequate for traffic expected by 1975. We had to have these roads to meet the economic growth, the population shift, and the defense needs of our growing country. Before these roads were started, there were slightly more than one million miles of paved roads and streets in the United States. This allowed just 82 feet for each of the nation's 74 million vehicles. What that 1961 interstate video from the Portland Cement Association fails to mention is that often the construction of highways went hand in hand with state led plans for urban renewal, otherwise known as the racially motivated desire to eliminate what officials called urban blight. In the words of James Baldwin, urban renewal really meant Negro removal. And that's exactly what happened in Cincy. When the federal government constructed I-75, the first interstate highway through Cincinnati in the late 50s and 60s, it ran right through the West End, which at the time housed Cincinnati's largest African-American community. Sandra Jones Mitchell is the former Avondale Community Council president and the founder of a nonprofit called Serving Older Adults Through Changing Times. As someone who works with seniors, she's intimately familiar with the impact highways have had on generations of Black Cincinnatians, starting with I-75. I had a friend, his name is Ted. He had pictures of what it was like before they built 75. He's now 80 years of age. The picture is so cool because you, you're you looking at the Union Terminal and you're looking at all these kids playing, which is now 75, and all those houses, I mean, thousands of apartments and houses there. It, it, was, it would just blow your mind. The West End was being torn apart. And when they moved 75 and they brought it through the heart of the West End, that displaced thousands of families. Over 25,000 residents were forced to leave the West End. Those who could found homes in other Black Cincinnati neighborhoods like Evanston, Avondale, Madisonville, and Walnut Hills. But these folks would soon witness new or expanding highways coming through their communities once again. Back in 2021, I interviewed Black residents in Evanston, Avondale, and South Cumminsville for the Urban Roots podcast series on Cincinnati. Again and again, they brought up highways 
and the negative impacts that these highways have had on their lives. In this documentary, we'll share their stories. Before it was Interstate 71, it was the Northeast Expressway. This 345-mile highway was meant to connect Louisville, Kentucky to Cleveland, Ohio. The portions of I-71 that ran through downtown were completed in 1970. But the final segment, called Cincinnati's Missing Link, was supposed to be a 2.5-mile stretch from Dana Avenue in Evanston through Avondale and Walnut Hills and ending in Mount Auburn. Community outrage delayed the project three and a half years. In the end, the project went through. Evanston was bisected. Homes and businesses destroyed. Residents like Mr. James Stallworth and Ms. Mary Ward remember it well. I watched them tear down the homes down through there. Yeah, it was, it was 71. Yeah, it was, yeah. They tear down, they put 71 through here. So... It had a great impact on my life. I mean, we had to move. I lost contact with a lot of people that I knew. Oh, I definitely remember. Um, because of how it cut the streets off. Since my family lived within blocks, you could just like come out the back door, run down the street, turn the corner, you're at my aunt Johanna's house. Cross the street, I'm at my grandparents' house. So with them cutting off the streets, like, I lost friends. I lost contact with, I remember two guys, specifically Kippy and Willie. I don't know what happened to them. Because right there where the highway is, like on Evanston, there was an apartment building where kids lived. So all of those families were just, they were just scattered. The freeway cut through the community at an elevation approximately 25 feet lower than the surrounding natural topography, creating a man-made valley. So to get from one side of Evanston to another, bridges were built to connect various parts of the neighborhood. It just kind of, it sliced our neighborhood in half and not only um, cut us off from the friends that we had who lived in the homes, also it divided the neighborhood. So then it became like, I live at the bottom of Evanston. This is the top of Evanston. So it became very territorial with the kids. The commercial district is not what it used to be either. The highway led to the loss of many businesses that used to be community anchors. I lived the next door to the Dewberry. It was up where the expressway go through. I lived right at the rail and where it ended at. It was a great big old apartment building across the street from St. Mark's. It was all stores. Do you remember Pop Squatters being on the corner? Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, Pop Squatters was on the corner. It was a butcher shop right across from Pop Squatters on Brewster on the other side. Several bars up and down the street just before you get to camps. It was a bar back in the 60s, 63 and 64. This was fantastic. It was a big club there on the corner, and it had a rotating bar in it. Well, I can remember where the dairy is. There was a White Castle. Right now, when you, the intersection of Clarion and Montgomery, it's camps, but that was a laundromat. On the other side of Clarion, there's a small building. That was a post office. On the side where the coffee shop is, those were little stores. I remember Riddle's Market. I remember the Pony Keg. Also, beauty parlors. And I remember being sent to one of the beauty parlors to get my hair done. Curtis's Barbershop was on the corner. There was a drugstore somewhere along in there. Hmm. Um, One of our neighbors had the dry cleaner, Mr. and Mrs. Birch. And where the apartment building is that used to be the old people's home, it was Evanston School. There was an actual school on that property. Fast forward 60 years, and only remnants of the commercial district remain today. New Black-owned establishments like Cream and Sugar and Kingsway Cafe now occupy some of the district's historic buildings. Hopeful signs that this neighborhood could one day reclaim the vibrancy it had before. I-74. It begins in Iowa and terminates in Cincinnati, where it runs right through the South Cumminsville neighborhood, a predominantly African-American community with high levels of home ownership. If you walk or drive through this neighborhood today, you'll notice ongoing construction for yet another highway expansion project undertaken by the Ohio Department of Transportation in recent years. This new road work is located in the exact same spot where a highway exit was removed some years back. Even today, 
With all we know about how highways have disproportionately affected African-American families in the past, there is little effort to prevent their construction in the present. Tim Kennedy is the South Cumminsville Community Council president and the creator of the South Cumminsville Family Reunion Picnic. He agreed to walk me around South Cumminsville and show me how the highway had cut up his neighborhood. Wow. And this street went straight through. Bam. Right. I mean, this is... All the way across the other side. No, no nothing. Just went all the way down. You turn here, you can go all the way out there. They just, they just cut the neighborhood off. What used to be connective streets where kids ran and played are now high-speed throughways for cars. Because they make this highway, and they just fly down here now. Not dissimilar to I-71. I-74 dead-ended a bunch of roads, many of which continue on the other side of the highway in the north side neighborhood, which actually used to be called Cumminsville. That's right. Both neighborhoods used to be one but are now split into two discrete sections, Northside and South Cumminsville. Their present-day border is the highway. I had to ask South Cumminsville residents I spoke to how much they remembered about what happened when the highway came through. And residents Annie Williams and Sister Alberta Wharton had a lot to say. The uh, highway come through, you remember that? That was the night of the 60s, because oh. I graduated in 69. So it was b- between that time. That's when they actually tore on down those homes. I don't know how many, but I had forgot all about all the way back down to Powers with the expressway running through that number. It split up as well. But now, just same, they had homes all down and Beatman. They, they were homes and they had streets, you know. Yeah, they had streets. You, you just look, it just looked crazy. And they got a lot of vacant uh, land where the homes were. Mm-hmm. They definitely did not care about our thing. community. I guess maybe they didn't consider enough monies. Was within the community. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. what is it like now? Or what is the area like for people who don't it's know? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. It's not that warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, no, mm-hmm. that you once had Same growing up. Because I mean, yeah, and it's so much blight. I mean, you know, with all this open land, so yeah. where homes were, and the fact that um, they haven't tried to put nothing back in the neighborhood. He meant that. They did say something about building up and building up and that. But the only thing they built was that expressway going across there. It always was like a more like a, a family a community because you know, everybody knew family. everybody. Yeah. People yeah. cared about the community. Yeah. It is 100% the community of South Cumminsville that keeps it going. All the occupied single family homes, the community organizations like working in neighborhoods, the sheer togetherness of the family reunion picnic. They all make the neighborhood incredibly unique and tight-knit. Despite the highways that try to divide them, the people of South Cumminsville keep building bridges to each other. While I-71 divided Evanston in the 70s, it also cut through the community of Avondale. The land around it depreciated, making it cheap real estate for the city's hospitals, universities, and zoo. Over the decades, as the neighborhood built up, the highway became busier. In 2017, the State Department of Transportation built the Martin Luther King Interchange, a new exit off I-71 near the hospitals and medical office buildings around Burnett Avenue. They said it was to alleviate congestion. Sandra Jones Mitchell, the former Avondale Community Council president and woman who works with the elders, was disappointed but not shocked by the development. The elders know when you talk to any older person at this point, 75 and up, They are not surprised by any of this. It's us young folks, you know, that are surprised that this is happening. So when they when they would talk about 75 and 71, I paid attention. I I I listened. One of my elders told me 30 years ago, he said, you know they're gonna build an exit off 71 between Dana and Taft. I said, I have no doubt. And I've been saying that for years. And when it finally happened, folks was like, well, who you been talking to? It's not about who I've been talking to. I paid attention to what was happening in Avondale. And so when they brought that to the Avondale Community Council, all I could do is just shake my head and say, it's here, y'all. We didn't act on it quick enough. Well, guess what? Avondale has five lanes. It used to be only two. Then it was four. Now on one side got three. The other side got two. Now, if you go stand on that corner, you will count about 60 to 70,000 cars coming through there a day. Avondale has about 160,000 cars coming through Avondale a day. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of traffic. 
it's no secret that the children's in Avondale asthma is higher than just about any community. The exhaust alone is killing the kids, the construction, the development. I feel that Avondale has had a for sale sign on it for the last 20 years. I've been fighting this fight for over 40 years. And, and do I see any end in sight? No, I don't. After the Urban Roots podcast Cincinnati series aired, Urbanist Media held a series of community conversations in Evanston, Avondale, and South Cumminsville. In Avondale, I invited longtime residents, Vice Mayor Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney and Andrea Carter of Invested Neighborhoods to join the panel. To end the conversation, Ms. Carter offered a word of warning and hope for the future. It's important to speak up if any new development is going on in the neighborhood. Just think about now that there's the MLK interchange and it's going to build up and there's going to be more density and more cars on that road going through that interchange. Because right now when the, st- when the shifts change at the um, UC and at Children's, they're all going down Barnet, making left on Martin Luther King, going on the highway. Mm-hmm. And just remember before MLK, it was just the Taft exit. You could get on and off. Mm-hmm. Now it's everything which you know is convenient in many ways Mm -hmm. but at the same time what we lost Mm -hmm. history that business district Mm -hmm. those the businesses right there i had a family photo taken in one of those buildings that's gone now that business district is now green space it's just unbelievable what was there the restaurant that was there i I think i attended a number of parties there at at alex's alex's Alex's, yes yes. Um, i mean just yes i mean the bowling alley i mean just and the nightclub, the lounge. It, I mean, just think what was lost, and now it's a patch of, patch of grass waiting to be developed. It's sad in one way, what was lost, but it's also gonna be interesting to see what they do with it. What we see with the new buildings that are next door to the UC building and what was the old Sears building, one of those buildings is black owned. Mm. And then the one across the street's gonna be black owned as well. Yeah. I think that's the difference from what was to what is right now. That's the key thing. Even today, as recently as 2017, we are repeating our history of injustices against Black Americans. Despite all we have learned about the ways interstates have disproportionately displaced African American families, there is still little effort put on reconciliation, on healing, on righting wrongs. But as Ms. Carter points out, right now is different from what it was. And it's up to us now to change what it will be. Thank you for listening. Your host is me, Deva Hussein Wetzel. We are edited by Connor Lynch and mixed by Andrew Calloway. Our story editors are myself, Deva, and Vanessa Quirk. Drone footage is by Mark Stucker. B-roll by Samaya Chappelle. And present day maps are by Sophia Fariz Rowe. Archival photos are from Laura Caney Porter and the Robert O'Neill Multicultural Arts Center. And thank you to our partners, Urbanist Media, Invested Neighborhoods, and the Cincinnati Public Library. Thanks so much to the neighborhood residents for sharing their stories. Annie Williams, Alberta Wharton, Tim Kennedy, Mary Ward, Mr. James Stallworth, Andrea Carter, Sandra Jones Mitchell, and last but certainly not least, Vice Mayor Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney. And thank you to our listeners. If you have not yet subscribed to the Urban Roots Podcast, please do so on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to leave us a rating. You can also find our work, including this video, on YouTube, Instagram, at Urban Roots Culture, and the web at urbanrootspodcast.com. So much, y'all. That was quick. I know, but because you Did know, we get through all the questions. Did we honestly, we got, we got. Uh, well, you get the most important thing. I love my community.